Welcome. Hey, we're going to do things a little bit backwards today. Is that okay? A little bit backwards. Um, I got the idea of doing it backwards simply because of the nature of the text that we're going to look at. And so what I want to do is kind of give us some preparatory um, comments and thoughts. You see that we have communion here. Um, communion we're going to receive later during the musical aspect of worship, kind of like a responsive uh, time. Uh, not everybody will come up at the same time. It'll be one of those times. If you're, if you're a person that likes structure and everything to be just so, you'll probably feel a little bit more stressed today. But it'll be okay. It'll be okay. A part of what, what we want to do is worship God. Just ponder that for a second. What we want to do today is worship. And there's various contexts of worship. Uh, some, and we all probably prefer a different context. That, you know, we all have a preferred context. There's a context like, uh, say you picture Jesus preaching to 5,000 men and their, and their wives and children. A, a large crowd. Some of us enjoy the large crowd situation and what happens in the dynamics of the large crowd that is the context through which you can worship better. Then there are other contexts that are, that are smaller. You know, maybe, maybe even this context. It's, it's still corporate. We're not alone. But this, it's a smaller, or you even got the, the idea of some like the small group concept where you meet in a home or you meet in a classroom and you, you dialogue about scripture and you share prayer requests and you lift each other up in prayer. That's, a, that's another context of worship. And then there's other contexts of worship that are very intriguing. And Joel, we've, we've shared some of that on like, say, a backpack trip where 10 or 12 of us go together and we, we just go off with an intent to fellowship, have a good time but in the midst of it, it's a, it's a retreat to worship God in that context. You see, there's all variety of contexts. There is the context when two or three gather together at a table. Two or three just conversing as friends about the journey of life and the journey of faith and something happens in the dynamic when you're sitting at a restaurant somewhere just sharing life together. There's the context of one-on-one. -on -one. The context where it's just you and the Lord. You, you, you got up early or you stayed up late and the issues of the day haven't arisen yet or are all behind you and it's just you're, you're kind of like getting alone getting into the word maybe or maybe you're listening to worship music or maybe you're just pondering and praying those personal moments do you have personal moments and so whatever this whole variety is the idea is to worship the Lord to lift him up now why do we worship God well first of all because he's God. <laughs> we worship because he's God. Now, it's not a sense in which you better worship God or else. Boy, it's hard to worship in that, in that situation. You know what I'm saying? It's like a sense of like fear. Like God is the Almighty and we're coming to him before him and so we better watch our P's and Q's and we better be really sure that everything's, everything's good or else. That is not the context of worship that God longs for. Um, all right, that's kind of like the introduction to the message section. What I have here is there's our, our communion elements. The, this is the body of Christ. And we, we, we pray that somehow... There's a mystery here. But Jesus himself, when he instituted the Last Supper, he instituted it with the words, this is my body, this is my blood. And we don't have to argue about 
to what degree the presence of the Lord is with us. But this is sacrament. And so we're going, in the, at the end of the service, or like toward the end during the musical part, different ones of us will come. It's open. Hopefully all of us will come at some point and, and receive the communion as an act of worship. But know that we call this a sacrament because there's some dynamic truth about the common ordinary bread and cup. The common ordinary, look at you, look, at, look around, human beings. We're all common ordinary human beings. We all are unique and different, wonderfully, fearfully made by the hand of our God. But I'm a human being, you're a human being, you're a human being. We're all human beings. We're just common, ordinary people. But somehow, in the mystery of worship, somehow the very presence of the Lord is communicated, is, is received, is, is encountered through the elements because it's sacrament. And when, when the divine interacts with us mere mortals... There's something about that that is life. It's, it's the opportunity to come to a place where we actually experience for a moment what we were made to be. We are, we are the image of Christ in this world. And to the degree that we actually reflect the one who dwells and lives and moves in us. To that degree, we are, we are worshiping him and reflecting him. And as we reflect him well, we are more fully alive than ever, if you could understand it that way. When the Bible talks about being dead, it's not talking about lack of breath. It's talking about not having communion with God. Life is found in interaction with God. You with me on this? So in that time, I, I invite you all that would want to. If you have a desire to connect with God, you're, you're good. We don't have a whole list of everything you have to make sure. No checklist that you have to, to receive the communion. Other than a desire. I want him. I want to know him. I, I want to know him more. If you have a, a heart's desire toward that, then this table is for you. It's for us all. And so, um, whether you're a member or not, it doesn't matter. Whether you're old or young, it doesn't matter. What matters is you come with a desire to know him. Fair to say? So, now, the, the text that we're going to get to is kind of a harsh text. It's the text in the Gospel of John, chapter number 2, where Jesus cleanses the temple. You've heard the story before where he upturns the money changers table, and he, he throws out the coins, he pushes out the animals, and he has zeal for the house of the Lord. He's upset at something. Jesus was upset at something. He was angry. We ask, well, what was he angry about? And whatever he was angry about then in this story, let us see to it that we don't replicate those things that make him upset. Is that, you with me on that? Let's not be the way they were then that created a, an anger in Jesus. Okay, so as you know, as is my pattern, and I love to do it this way, we must set the context. So here's what I want to do in setting the context. It, we're going to get to John chapter 2, starting in verse 13. We're going to get there. 
But there's a John chapter 1 before there's a John chapter 2. And that's on purpose. And a side note is because we're going to get to the cleansing of the temple, which John writes at the very beginning. He's in chapter 2. The other Gospels tell the same story at the Passion Week, like toward the end of his ministry. And so John is telling us something about why he's placing this story early on in the message as opposed to later on in the message. So um, in, in the Gospel of John, chapter number one, you, you, you know how it starts, right? In the beginning, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and, and as that story goes on, it, it talks about nothing was created without the Word, and the Word was indeed God himself. And then verse 14 of chapter 1 says these words, The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace. John is saying it all starts with God. And from the early on, he says, not only does it all start with God, but you need to know that God is... I don't want to say this. If God doesn't come close, then God is too far away. And so the gospel message, it starts, and John is like, the beauty of this is Christ Jesus came. He was a part of the whole creation story, but he comes and he dwells among us. John is intent on us understanding that Jesus has come, and when Jesus comes, he is dwelling, tabernacling among us. We could go into the word dwell. It's the same word in the Old Testament as tabernacle. And then you think about the tabernacle is where the people of God met, met with God at the tabernacle. There's this, all, all this is in this. So you see that the point in verse number 14 is that he has come, God has drawn himself close and wants to dwell among us. Cool, isn't it? This is the gospel. This is, this, this is the gospel story. And then, forwarding a little bit, you get the story of John the Baptist. Well, then John the Baptist, in verses 17 and 18, it says this. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son who is himself God and is in close relationship with the Father, he has made him known. It's an interesting language here. There's, John is saying there's Moses and the law. That's one thing. Well, Jesus comes with grace and truth. That's another thing. And if we misunderstand, we say, well, there's a contrast between the law that God gave through Moses and grace and truth. It's less of a conflict. It's more of a completion. So they're not in contrast to one another. But whatever the law of the Old Testament was intended to do, Ten Commandments. The first four is about our relationship with God, right? Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, so you have no other gods before me. Uh, honor the Sabbath, keep it holy. Honor that time in which you keep your connection with God. And then the last six are all about how we relate to one another. Love God, love people. The law of Moses. Well, the Old Testament, the law of Moses is about loving God, loving people in summary. And then Jesus comes with grace and truth. Fulfilling the law of love. How does he fulfill the law of love? Well, we had just learned in verse 14 that he comes and dwells among us. And we learn in this verse in 18 that not only does he dwell among us, but he makes God known. So John is like saying, God is all about coming to be among you and helping you understand 
who he is. And that is presented as a good thing. It's what we want. It's what we're made for. It's what we were created to be. To have an encounter with God such that you could say as a testimony, God is with me. And God is opening my eyes to who he is. I, I'm sorry, I'm, it's like, oh, I, I, I should use that every once in a while. Somebody going to sleep, I'll just hit my thing. But, you know, it's just it's this longing on God's part. If you think this, Jesus came from heaven to earth. Not born in the palace, born in the manger. So the whole, inc- the whole thing, he's, by the way, wrong side of the tracks too. He, can anything good come from Nazareth? We learned that in John chapter 1 with Nathaniel. And it, anyway, get, that, was a, that was a rabbit trail. But the, the idea of us encountering personally that God is among me, he is with me, he is in me. And I am coming to know him. Those are interesting concepts. Now, we get this next story. There's the calling of the disciples. And I think not too many weeks ago we talked about the call of Jesus. To, of, remember we talked about Nathaniel was called out from under the fig tree. How many remember that message? Out from under the fig tree. The fig tree is the illustration of our comfort and the things that, the things that we take comfort in. The things that give us a sense of security. Jesus calls the disciples out from under that to find their peace and their comfort and their security in him. What, what God is making clear in the Gospel of John is this. Knowing the God who comes near and makes himself known is more of a sense of peace and security than anything your fig trees can produce. And then we get this story where Jesus, in the Gospel of John, it's the first miraculous sign from Jesus that God has arrived on the scene. And that, as we know, is... We Nazarenes kind of don't know how to work with this one. He changes the water into grape juice. I know. He changes the water into wine. Which is a, it's, it's a story right at the beginning. It's, it's still in chapter 1. He changes the water into wine. And so what is he doing when he changes the water into wine? Well, you get the whole context of the, first of all, the the social realm. Here's a young couple that's getting married. They're starting their new life together. If they run out of wine at their wedding, in their culture, they're starting their relationship out together in shame. They ran out of wine. They should have counted the cost. They should have known how much. They should have known that there was going to need be a need for all this. They should have provided for it all along, but they didn't. And Mary, Jesus' mother, comes to Jesus and says, we got a problem here. They're out of wine. And Jesus said, that's not my problem. And, and Mary basically says to the servants, say, you do what he says with great confidence. They're Jesus, God in flesh, the one who draws near the one who came to reveal God is getting instructions from Mary. A mere mortal. Blessed of God, of course. But this, that, that, that in it, John is giving us this whole, we have God among us and here we have a human being telling God what to do. Is that too strong language? And Jesus says, it's not my time yet. Implied in this whole story is, yes, it is time. It's time for you to start moving. And so, of course, he changes the water to wine. It goes to the, it goes to the, the head of the, of the banquet. And then the comment is made to the couple. Boy, most people save the cheap stuff for last because everyone's had enough to drink. You can get away with the cheap stuff, but you have saved the best for last. So get this. Jesus was more concerned about 
not having this couple start this relationship in shame, but he shifted it from not starting it in shame, but starting it with honor. I mean, Jesus could have made common ordinary wine, and then this couple would start, the implication would be, this couple would start this relationship just normal. Just like, you know, getting through, enjoying the wedding and all that kind of stuff. But no, when Jesus comes and involves himself in the relationships, even the most meaningful relationships that we have as human beings, what he does is he brings honor into that relationship. That is good, isn't it? Jesus is the very reality of honor in life and in relationship. This is powerful. This is a powerful message. Not only has God come to dwell among us, not only has he come to make God known, But in making himself known, he's doing something within relationships that brings them into this joy, into this good, into this wonder. Why do we grieve so much when someone we love is taken from us? Why? If you don't care about them, why why would you shed a tear? Right? There's something in how we are wired, something in how we are made. When a loved one is taken from us, whether through divorce or passing to the life to come, it's painful. Right? Everyone in this room can probably raise their hand, say, It is painful. It is painful. And this is the strange thing. It's supposed to be painful. Because relationships are supposed to be close. And relationships that get broken is not the way life was intended. God never intended or wanted that. We're getting that from this whole story of God coming to us, making himself known. And of course we know that biblically the, the, the metaphor, the analogy of wine is the Holy Spirit. Right? Jesus, right from the get-go in the Gospel of John, chapter number one, is making God known, making God close, and making him real in us. Would you remember that when you come and receive the communion? Because yes, in one sense, if you miss out, it's just a wafer and grape juice. But in another sense, if you have faith, you are receiving afresh and anew the God who came, made himself close shed his blood to break any barrier between us and sends forth his Holy Spirit which is the new covenant in his blood. This is powerful. It's truths we know. We know this. No no one's heard anything brand new here. But we're being reminded because our worship of God, our worship of God is not as linked to what we know as much as knowing him. Do you see the shift? Oh, I know all about God. I read through the Bible. If you don't, if that's your demeanor, I know all about God, then you don't know God. Because I know God and I don't know him. In a weird kind of way. Our God is a mystery. He's too big. In one context, recently we talked about this whole idea that, um, Bill, was it? Maybe it was us in our our breakfast. If God were to make him, God is like handicapped. He, He can't make himself fully known. 
or we die. Remember when Moses, who talked with God face to face as a friend talks to a friend in the Old Testament? Moses says, I want to see you. I want to see you. And God basically says, ah, I'd love for you to see me, but you can't handle it, man. You can't handle it. But here's what I'll do for you. You know where that cleft of the rock is? You go deep in that cleft. You go way inside. Like a cleft of the rock is like you got these, these mountains, and then there's breaks in the mountain, and you, you get yourself tucked in there. So then if you picture this wall of mountain in this narrow, about as wide as a man, and then there's this, this little channel here. And then God, the Bible says, t- puts his hand to shelter and then shows, you know, passes by with his back. You get the, the image here of this story is, if you're going to see God, a little glimpse of God, he's going to have to tuck you way in the rock, he's going to have to put his hand to shield you, and he can only show you his back, and that itself is going to make you tremble. Look at the wonder of who God is, and, and God wants us to know him. It's not like God is so righteous that you're going to have to be afraid to death. No. He is so righteous and awesome that it's going to, it's going to affect you. <laughs> when God draws near, you don't just stand there like a bump on a log. Well, what are you supposed to do? Don't worry about it. You will. You will respond as God draws close to you. How many would, by testimony, would just, just, I've had moments where God has encountered me and my heart rate went up or tears came to my eyes or I fell out to the ground or I just didn't know what to do. I just, yeah, how many, I've I've had those encounters. You had, yes. Now who told you what you're supposed to do when he shows up? Nobody does. Nobody does. Now, John is saying God is showing up. He wants you to know him. He's going to put his Holy Spirit within you and bring honor to this relationship. And then he gets to this story of the cleansing of the temple. If it's all right with you, I will start reading at John chapter 2, verse number 13. Since you've been sitting for a while, if you don't mind, if you're able, would you stand with me? It'll give you a break and it'll honor his word. Jesus clears the temple courts. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords, drove them all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it is written, this is from Psalm 69, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responded to him, What sign can you show us to prove your authority to do this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it in three days. They replied, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you are going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. And then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. Lord Jesus, continue to be present and open our eyes in the midst of this. We pray, Lord God, for not only discernment to proclaim a message... But Lord, we pray for the ability to see you, to hear you, to experience you in worship. And Lord, whether there's any emotion at all, that's not what we look for. We want, oh God, to lift you up and to honor you. We praise you, Jesus. Amen.
and amen. So what is this all about? You got Moses and the law. Well, as we read the Old Testament, we get, we get the instructions through Leviticus. Everybody loves to read Leviticus. Numbers, that's all our favorite dynamic book, Leviticus. Leviticus is about the holiness of God. It's about the righteousness of God. God is so holy. God is so righteous. There's a means to get into his presence. God had given instructions for the means, the patterns to get into his presence. The Old Testament law gave us those means is the, the means of the tabernacle or later the means of the temple that was built and, and uh, the, you know Solomon's temple and then eventually that temple got destroyed and then the second temple Ezra Nehemiah was built and this temple here that took 46 years 46 years this was this was a, a it's almost it's like another temple being built by Herod a pagan which is another interesting thing There's this pattern that happens. Two patterns going side by side. One pattern is God gives instructions and you follow these instructions, then an experience of forgiveness and relationship can occur. The pattern of the, of the sacrifice. The pattern of what they were doing here. You see, Jesus is overchanging the money changers table and he's... He's sending out these animals for sacrifice. But the interesting thing is, the law of Moses told them to do these things. <laughs> like, they hadn't necessarily made all this up for themselves. In some sense, those that were authentic and not trying to rip everybody off, which there was probably some of that too. It's kind of like, you know, we've talked about the Reformation here in recent, recent days. What, caused the, what was the motive behind the Reformation? Well, the church, the Roman church, the Roman Catholic church had gotten corrupt. Not that the doctrines of the church themselves were all way off. It's that the pattern of the church was one thing. Those things that were an attempt to actually worship God, that wasn't the wrong thing. It was the corruption. It was the selling of indulgences. It was the using authority to, to bilk the people, the common worshipers. It was the, it was the threat of excommunication of God's common people. So it wasn't that God just hates the Roman Catholic Church. What God hates is corruption. The Reformation was about returning to a, a link with God by faith. Ready to admit, and probably you aren't either, that if you're Protestant, you got it all together. And if you're Catholic, you still got a bunch of problems. I think the Catholics got problems. The Protestants got problems. All God's people got problems. How we organize our theologies, whether we're Roman Catholic, Lutheran, Reformed, Wesleyan, Independent something, none of these is the avenue through which God saves. The salvation of God. By the way, what is salvation? God, salvation is God's restoration of all that was lost and broken from the fall, right? Adam and Eve in the garden from the fall. From, from then on, we've had all kinds of sin problems. In, in sin, broken down, we, we, we look at it two main different ways. We see sin as defiance and sin as brokenness. Based on your theological slant, you will either emphasize defiance or brokenness. In my own personal evolution, my early pastorate, my early thinking theologically, I was very much in sin is defiance against God. 
And I'm, there's truth in that. But somewhere over the course of the journey, I begin to realize that I think sin is better described as being fooled, being deceived, being broken. You ever hear the phrase, hurt people, hurt people? Angry people create havoc, so to speak. Selfish people ruin stuff. All, all this kinds of stuff. So I am not negating the sense of defiance. If you're stick, stiff-necked and defiant against God, go for it. If you can stand before God with your puny little you, go for it. See how that works out. But that presents this sense of God in an old kind of a way. Is God holy and righteous? Yes, he is. What is his righteousness? Ah, his righteousness is a descriptor of who he is, right? Sometimes we say God's righteousness, God's holiness is this standard. It's this idea, it's this concept that we elevate up to the highest that it could be. And that's, that's how God is. He's this holy standard that no one can meet. That would be to miss, I'm sure there's some truth in that. Please understand. But that misses the heart of God. The heart of God is demonstrated by the creator God coming and being born in the midst of this dark world. Coming to dwell among us. To reveal that we would know him in such a way that there would be honor and joy. Not in such a way that there would be fear and trembling. The fear and trembling is out of awe, not out of fear. I have trembled before the presence of God. I, I've told you a story about in this office over here, and it's been a couple years now, but there was something that happened that made me scared. But it wasn't that it was like the fear of God's wrath. It was like the, wow, I can't believe it. I can't believe God is like that. I don't know what to do with that completely. But it's awesome. <laughs> it's good. It's a wonderful thing. What's your encounter? What's your experience with God? It's what I hope that we're reaffirming in, in this time together. What made Jesus so upset in this story was the things that created barriers to people that are coming to worship. So if there's anything that Christ Jesus is still angry at, he's angry at any attitude, any demeanor, any rules and regulations, anything set up by the church or by you or by others that makes a barrier between God and common ordinary people like you and me. Whatever barrier there is, between us and God, that is sin. Sin is a barrier. Sin keeps us from Him. And it shows up in a gazillion ways. I don't think I need to describe sin to you. And it's far more than abortion and homosexuality. It shows up in so many more ways. In subtle ways in my own judgmentalism in subtle ways of my own sense that I'm better than other people. You see, if, I'm, if I feel in some way I'm better than somebody else, that is a barrier to, between me and that somebody else. Is it not? Isn't it? And if I communicate such that you could come to God, but there's these barriers here, and until you take care of those barriers, you can't come to God. That is sin. The gospel message is good news. Yes, these barriers are keeping you from God. Good news, God has destroyed those barriers on the cross and you can freely come. That's Bible, that's gospel. When Jesus died, the veil in the temple was torn from top to bottom, right? Making access so the common person could go into the presence of God without fear of wrath and judgment. This is wonderful. How do I get in on this? Trust belief
you want to? Sometimes our want begins this way. It's like, put it this way. I had a piece of cake. It was a good piece of cake just last night. Carly, thank you. I had this piece of cake. I tasted and saw that it was good. <laughs> Which made me want more. Can't you tell? That's how our desire for God works. Gospel of John, chapter 1, the disciples are, they go, Jesus, where are you staying? And he says, come and see. Come and see. You see, this idea of if you taste him, you'll want more of him. It won't be like that. What's that? What do you call that stuff in your refrigerator? Oh, kimchi. kimchi, yeah. No. <laughs> Anyone know what kimchi is? If you're unfamiliar with it, go, go visit the cousins and she'll show you and you'll go, yeah. Yeah, that's not it. Cake, kimchi. I'm taking the cake, I tell you that. God, not God, I'm taking God every time. Every time. All the time. So why do we gather together, church? By the way, thank you for being here. Isn't it good to... I mean, in the, in the depths of the COVID, it's like when we had like 18 of us here, it was, it was, it was painful, painful, painful. And um, because there's something about social worship. Thank God for the 18. But we were missing the other 100. You know what I'm saying? It's like we're missing the other hundred. And, and, uh, and, you know, I'm not blaming anybody with all the COVID and all that good stuff, but it's just good. Thank you for coming back. But let us worship together. I'm good, you know, the, the worship team is going to come. And they're going to sing songs. I invite you to participate in the singing of songs. I also invite you to do the best you can to be intentional about spending time with the Lord in prayer if you want to kneel at the altar go. that's fine, if you want to stay where you're at that's fine, somewhere in the midst of it, if you want to come and receive the communion yes, do that Lift up people in prayer. Some of you know Jill, Jill Allen's mother is, is in the hospital. She had a heart valve replacement. And it's not all gone well. and So uh, her name's Lynn. Pray for Lynn. Um, Nancy Paul's in the hospital. Our sister, uh, Vicki Burke, has been struggling with pain all the time. So there's, and there's a whole number of people. John Walpole, we'll pray for him. Um, let this be a, not, not a, a litany of, oh, God, do this, oh, God, do this, oh, God, do this. We can, we, let's lift each other up in prayer. But the real hope is that each one of us can connect with God a little bit closer than what we were when we walked in. Jesus, somehow, we invoke, we invite your very presence among us. We know that you are here. We praise you, Lord God, for the gospel message that you long to be with us. And you don't want any barriers because you love us. So Lord, enable us, empower us, inspire this worship together, we pray. In Jesus' name. As this goes, I want to say one more thing. When you feel as though you've come to a, an accomplished, uh, it's the wrong word, a place where you've encountered God and it's, it's gone its course and you feel like this service for you is complete. Did I word that right? Like, then you can feel free to go. That, I don't know that we're going to have an official end of the service. You follow me? So this is the official beginning and the official end announcement I hope you don't up and leave right now 
But if you do, no condemnation. You know, nobody's judging anybody here. Um, and also, would you just go ahead and turn the recording off so that people don't worry about, is this all getting recorded? He's going to turn the recording off.